Well, hello, everybody. I'm John Barnwell here, north of the city of Detroit. I'm here with Dr. Douglas Gabriel, south of the city of Detroit, here in the center of the universe in Michigan here. And uh, it's been quite remarkable that the recent events with the Venus-Jupiter conjunction making an interesting image, which brings to mind the understanding of the realms of the, the kidneys and the realm of the liver. And that these are levels of your organism that, that give you access to certain realms of being, just as other organs give you access to other realms. And so there's all of these facets of, that make up a human being, that it's, it's a collective effort as a result of the deeds of myriads of spiritual hierarchies. And so in looking into Rudolf Steiner's indications regarding the nature of that mystery and how it comes into relationship to the mystery of Golgotha, which occurred at the turning point of time. And that's what we're pursuing here is the deeper mysteries that are, are concealed, but they're open secrets. They're, they're there for you to access, but it's easiest to do that, as we've said before, either artistically or musically, or which might be counterintuitive to some people through the study of history. And so in getting into a closer relationship with this group of ideas, Rudolf Steiner is the, the singular individual that lays emphasis on the fact that there's a metamorphosis of being and consciousness throughout human history and that people in different cultural periods and epochs, they possess different faculties and as we approach the turning point of time, these faculties in large measure were donated to us through the gifts of spiritual beings. And with the incarnation of Christ, there was a transformation of this particular process. And as we moved from the mystery of Golgotha, it gradually unfolded so that the individual capacities could be applied towards the development of one's vehicles, one's astral, etheric, physical, and ego. And in that process, come into relationship with the Christ being. And so that's what we want to explore today. I don't want to go on too long. I just trying to give Douglas a good lead up because I can't wait to hear what he has to say. How you doing there, Douglas? Marvelous, marvelous on the south side of Detroit, where I'm out here in the woods. And uh, you've chosen to carry on with a topic that is absolutely profound and shakes up some people when they hear it. As a matter of fact, this is one of Rudolf Steiner's indications that we're going to talk about today that can get people the most uh, excited about anthroposophy or can absolutely befuddle them to the point that they just don't know what's going on. But what we're going to talk about today is something that you said people responded to when we had our last talk, when we started talking about, as my, you started talking about, the superhuman beings from Vulcan. Of course, there's also superhuman beings from Venus, Mercury, and Vulcan. And those are a, another one of the things that just absolutely get people um, discombobulated when they try to comprehend these things. But once you comprehend them and once you understand what the physical, etheric, astral, and ego are all about, and then the higher three spiritual bodies and the three spiritual aspects of the soul, then you can see that what John just mentioned is the key factor. There's a descent from Saturn, Sun, Moon, Earth, and then there's, that's the descent, and that's the Mars cycle. Then there's the Mercury cycle, Jupiter, Venus, and Vulcan. And they relate to one another in that they we repeat each other at a higher level and they relate to the specific kingdoms that were laid down as donations during the descent of the spirit into the human being. Of course, the ego 
of the human being didn't really happen until the mystery of Golgotha. And so today, what we're going to talk about, I'm going to let you uh, get into the deep waters so they can't blame me for this, because I, I don't usually talk about this particular aspect of the grail, the etheric body, and the um, spiritual economy, the realm of spiritual economy. Um, I oftentimes refer to that as Christ in the etheric, or the realm of Shambhala, or the etheric realm around the earth that also mirrors itself in the etheric body of the human being. So we are going to get into some very deep water today, and I'm going to let you jump in first, uh, see if you put your water wings on first or not, and then I'll certainly expand it. Because as you know, uh, I have a tendency to um, be expansive. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the theme that we're going to address today, John? Okay, the uh, elusive wisdom that, that we're seeking here is, is, uh, has to be continually supported through, through one's personal efforts in order to be able to even grasp what we're discussing. And uh, one of the most important aspects of Rudolf Steiner's work and mission was to bring an understanding of what he called spiritual economy. And I'm going to give you a quotation from that uh, particular lecture cycle. It's available here on YouTube and it's also over at the Rudolf Steiner archive if you prefer it in a text version. But I will just start, give you the intro to it so that you can get the kind of the general theme as it represents, and, and I quote, today we shall stress more of the occult side of yesterday's observation. The four post-Atlantean cultures somehow had to reflect the great cosmic events in the souls of human beings as they had happened in her historical sequence. However, beginning with the 13th or 14th century of our cultural epoch, such a reflection no longer took place because the external events in human evolution must be traced to more profound reasons. We know that the etheric bodies of the great Atlantean initiates had been preserved for the seven holy rishis in ancient India. And we also know how the etheric and astral body of Zarathustra had been woven into Moses and Hermes. Moses with the etheric body and Hermes with the astral body. And, and I continue again. At any time, the possibility existed that such etheric bodies, which had been cultivated and prepared by the initiates, could be further used in the spiritual economy of the world. But other things took place as well for especially important personalities. Such etheric bodies are formed in the higher worlds. When somebody was especially important for the mission of humanity, an etheric body or an astral body was woven in the higher worlds and was then imprinted on this personality. So there you have it. It's this whole idea. And this can work in uh, numerous ways. And there's, there's a doctrine that's also contained if you do a deeper study within Tibetan Buddhism or in Advaita Vedanta or, or other teachings of the East, <clears throat> this whole idea of the Kayas. And that you have uh, in Buddhism, for example, you have the Nirmanakaya, Sambhogakaya, and Dharmakaya. So the, the Nirmanakaya would be that astral vehicle and the uh, sambhogakaya would be the etheric vehicle and the dharmakaya would be the atman principle the which is the higher image of the physical and so we have this uh, particular doctrine where rudolf steiner is saying that there's can be woven these special vehicles for beings with special missions but there's also the aspect of it where he talks about when somebody brings 
uh, a vehicle to a particular high level of development, that that is preserved in the spiritual world and can be used as like a, a so to speak, template or even be actually utilized and incarnated by a significant individual. And there's ways in which this can happen because it can be that it enters at a certain point earlier in their life and continues on, or it can come within the relationship and make a seal or, a, or an impression or imprint on the vehicle of someone to transform its structures. Or it could just come into relationship to individuals at certain inspiring points in their life so that it's not necessarily continual. And so this is a, a very, very intriguing concept. It absolutely is. And it's uh, shocking for someone who studies Christology to finally be given the pieces to the puzzle that then complete the puzzle. And that's what we're talking about. With the descent of the spirit into the human being, we have the donations and the gifts of many higher beings, actually sets of higher beings as they worked in the realm of ancient Saturn, ancient sun, ancient moon, and then into our earth incarnation. So what you can literally say that in those ancient periods, gifts of Christ were given to us. One of them was the ability to stand upright, another ability to speak, another the ability to think. And then at the mystery of Golgotha, the ego was given to the human being. So you might say that everything that we have is a donation of hierarchical beings specifically led by Christ to create this vehicle that could be a completely free ego. Now, the necessity of that is if we weren't free and we could still have natural clairvoyance like the people of the past did, we would be able to say, oh, we can see God. And then you'd have no choice. But the point of having an ego, particularly in the earth incarnation, is to make up your mind about which direction you're going to go. With the descent of the spirit into the human being, we can see that these donations were uh, of hierarchical beings were countermanded by fallen angels, archangels, archai beings. So at each stage, a being can fall backwards, hierarchical beings can fall backwards. The human can fall backwards now. The, our physical body, our etheric body, our astral body have been given to us, and we've done very little to create it because we simply are babes in the woods when it comes to manifestation in the physical world or in the spiritual world. So we had to um, gratefully, we should gratefully accept these gifts and these donations, but we should know where they came from and we should know what they are. Now, as we reach this low point of the descent of the spirit and we start to turn at the mystery of Golgotha, we aren't left alone. Christ has given us his perfected vehicles and Christ only incarnated once for three and a half years in the body of which was actually referenced, the Zarathustra influence, the Buddha, Buddha influence, the influences of Moses and Hermes, all of those things were pulled together to be offered to the physical body of Jesus of Nazareth. But only later in the three and a half years of his ministry did the Christ being, the cosmic Christ being, descend into the ego of Christ and into his lower bodies and into the higher bodies. So Christ came and he is perfecting all of these vehicles. That's the reason he had to descend into the earth. That's the reason that now, after he ascended into heaven, he came back into the realm of the etheric realm around the earth, the etheric body of the earth, what he, Steiner calls Shambhala, which of course, everyone uh, knows that name. It's a name given to a magical realm that seems to be immortal, eternal, and always anew. Well, what is that realm? That realm is the etheric realm. And when we talk about the etheric body and the copies of Christ's etheric body, his astral body, and his ego have been given to those who can rise up and receive them. This isn't like the descent. This is the ascent. And you must rise up out of your own powers. And when you start to resemble these characteristics of the multiple copies of the perfected vehicles of Christ in the physical, etheric, astral, ego, 
then we can basically what I call morphic through morphic morphic resonance through resonating with that perfected vehicle, we can start to take that into ourselves. Now that for an initiate goes a lot faster than it does for the basic evolution of mankind through what Steiner calls progressive evolution. But because we are starting on the ascent, if you don't ascend, you are descending. If you even stay in a stasis in the same place, you are not progressing with evolution. Now, one doesn't uh, imagine that Christ comes down and forces his perfected vehicles in anyone. That isn't the way Rudolf Steiner describes it. He says that it is out of their own actions that one or another of their bodies may take on one of these replicas from the realm of spiritual economy into one of their own bodies and work on its perfection. It doesn't mean that they became equal to Christ's etheric body or his astral body or his ego. It means that for a moment, they were in direct contact with the Christ being in the etheric realm. And it is that that they take on to themselves through a free will and through developing the wisdom that can then receive these gifts of love that Christ is willing to give each of us if we can rise up to that realm and embody that in our own self. So this is very important to understand that these gifts are there, but they're not being forced upon us. And that if you do not rise up and start to resemble them, then essentially you're going backwards. And that is what we see quite prevalent in our age. We see people turning back into animals, even going into the realm of the plants and the minerals, and even into subnature realms where the demons are rule. So you can, out of complete free will, accept one of these vehicles once you have evolved to that point. But we need to remember that it is the gifts of Christ, the three pre-earthly deeds of Christ, standing upright, speaking, and thinking, the ego, our own ego, that is really a replica of, the, of Christ's ego, is also the gift of the mystery of Golgotha. And then after that, we have the gift of memory. And without that, we wouldn't be reincarnating individuals because we wouldn't be able to remember from one incarnation to the next the capacities that we had developed. So what we're really doing here is this is the path of evolution. For an initiate, it can happen very quickly, but it doesn't mean that the initiate becomes literally a copy of Christ's etheric astral or ego. It means that at certain moments, they may embody those characteristics and that uh, those spiritual qualities. But when it comes down to the initiate, they're moving ahead very, very quickly. And what you mentioned last time is that there are beings, what Steiner called superhuman beings, or uh, he called them supermen, but that's, I say, superhuman beings. And they come from the realm of Venus, Mercury, and Vulcan, which are the realms that you go into as you evolve with your three spiritual natures. And those are the realms of the angels, the archangels, and the archai. So even when you're tapping into those realms, it is really through the love of Christ that you're able to access those higher spiritual beings and bring them into your life. For instance, angels alight in our thoughts as moral imaginations that are created out of love. Well, imagination, inspiration, and intuition, and specifically intuition, is a gift of love of Christ. So again, Christ is not abandoning, abandoning us. He has already offered us the whole future, if you are highly developed, spiritually developed, that you can begin to receive these gifts from the future into yourself in the present time. Normal people moving along at the, I hate to say, standard speed of uh, the progression of spiritual evolution right now is attempting to take on moral imagination. In other words, their thoughts, which most materialists who believe in science as a god, they don't really have thoughts. They have dark shadow thoughts that are left over in what you might call an anti-Shambhala realm. And the human beings then are drawn down into subnature through the aramonic impulses 
that allow them to have thoughts that are actually completely dead, shadow thoughts, gray shadow thoughts, he calls them, that make you fall back into the web of literally Araman, a web that is based upon materialism, a web that wishes to hold you in the material world and not let you evolve. But for those who are progressing at the proper rate, they will start to notice that when they're having spiritual thoughts, that they are their spiritual thoughts. They may be the grail vessel to hold those spiritual moral imaginations, higher forms of thinking, but they are not their own. They are indeed the shared higher spiritual moral imaginations of angels. And when they have higher feelings or moral inspiration, then they're going into the realm of the archangels. And when they have higher deeds that are based upon wisdom and love out of total freedom, then they are reaching into the realm of intuition, which is the realm of the archai. So these gifts that are coming to us from the future to us already belong to us. It's like when we finally highly spiritually develop, your ego is going to look like it is part of what Rudolf Steiner calls a group soul ego of the Christ, which recognizes the individuality of each person. You don't become just an amorphous glob of beings who are like a tribe or an egregore uh, of something much lower. No, you actually become part of a communion and a community that is indeed interacting with the spiritual hierarchies. And all of these, I will emphasize, are gifts of Christ. So at this point, you would have to say the three pre-earthly deeds, the deeds of mem uh, the gift of memory, and these three other gifts that are available through moral imagination, moral inspiration, and moral intuition are at least seven gifts of Christ that are given to us, which in fact, we don't deserve any of them. So the beauty of it is, is that when you can understand that with humility, and you can understand that wisdom fills our world, and that any love that comes through you is not really yours, you may direct it, but it's the love, the mercy, the grace of the spiritual hierarchy, and particularly Christ. So this is a very, very exciting topic, and I can actually say that I can't ever remember, except in discussions with you and Joe Visconti, any anthroposophist anywhere who ever addressed these questions. Uh, now and then they might refer to one point or another, but they can't, they do not put it in perspective. And that's what you need. You need to understand this is a complete and natural process that we are, if we are becoming initiated, we are speeding up that process to pull in those moments of intuition, inspiration, and imagination that can then basically take your etheric, astral, and ego and bless it with chrism oil, which means that you become Christened or you become a Christened being who is working in this group soul of Christ and beings who are taking more responsibility now for the future than most people are. So people who are tapped into the principle of spiritual economy are in fact rushing into the future. And those who are not realizing that Christ's second coming has already happened in the etheric realm, and it can be seen from the astral realm, then unfortunately, I'm sorry to have to say that they're falling behind in evolution and they really need to catch up because evolution goes forward with or without you. And it can go forward very, very quickly if you are an initiate and it can go backwards into a realm that we could call the anti-Shambhala realm if you do not realize the gifts, these seven gifts of Christ, and there are more gifts, but those seven specific gifts of Christ are indeed the seven-story mountain. That's the ladder, Jacob's ladder to heaven. That is your communion with the hierarchy. So it's an exciting topic, and I'm so glad that you brought it and that we can attempt to address it. But no matter what we say, what specifically what I say, is only going to be the tip of the iceberg. Yes. In, in the Kabbalah, they have... a. a concept that's that's related to this and it's the the work of the makaba the work of the chariot that you're you're building the vehicles and it's a a challenge of conscious 
participation. But in earlier epochs, the uh, idea of spiritual economy worked within specific groups of people or tribes. So Rudolf Steiner discusses how the etheric uh, body of Shem was preserved and served as the prototype for the ancient Hebrew people. And if a individual came along who was to be a prophet, that he would actually incarnate the actual etheric vehicle of Shem. He says, but that changed at the mystery of Golgotha because it was no longer serving a tribal type of basis, but it was something that was universal for all mankind. And uh, But in keeping with what Douglas was saying regarding that love, in the uh, lecture cycle that was published as Christ and the Human Soul in North Chapping in July 12th, 1914, Rudolf Steiner says, and I quote, love is not something we acquire willingly and not something that is acquired through wisdom. Love is in the realm of feeling. But we know and must admit that the human soul would not be the way it should be if it could not be filled with love. Thinking about the essence of the soul, you come to the conclusion that a human soul would not be a human soul if it could not love. And so that really uh, gives one an interesting take on love because it's something that, that you don't take up willingly. That's like, that's pretty uh, significant. But in describing these events, Rudolf Steiner talks about how with the mystery of Golgotha, then you had the the apostles and his followers going out and spreading it. And that in the first Christian centuries, it was uh, the activities of, of these people and their students and, and their students after that, that there was this historical relationship to the event itself. But by, by the 10th and the 11th and 12th century, uh, this had, had subsided really with the, really with the uh, the mission of St. Augustine, he, he refers to as an important turning point because Augustine was uh, such a key individual who had been able to frame certain ideas within Christianity that showed, uh, as Rudolf Steiner describes, that he had incarnated uh, one of the uh, christened etheric bodies, that he had a capacity for uh, understanding it within the line of wisdom and with his background in monarchism and in uh, Neoplatonic Greek uh, philosophy and so forth. He, he had a very unique capacity and in juxtaposition to that because in the same token, he was very kind of irascible in his astral body. You know, the, he, he had a big aptitude. He said he was so he was so fat he could hardly get through a door, you know? And uh, so you have this kind of uh, contradiction. You, you like to think of great individuals as being great in every way, but no, it, it doesn't <laughs> rarely ever work like that. Uh, and uh, different from that, he makes reference to St. Francis of Assisi. St. Francis, who was not an intellectual type soul. It's just that he was able, because he had a transformed astral body, that he was able to conquer that realm of desire and, and really inhabit the realm of love, such as Rudolf Steiner was just referring to. But uh, to continue within lecture seven or lecture nine of the, the uh, principle of spiritual economy, he says, and I quote, we see how Christian writers in the first few centuries after the Christ event still worked on the basis of an oral tradition that was transmitted by the disciples of the apostles, who set great value on a direct physical transmission of the Christ event. However, this would not have been a sufficient building block for later centuries. And that is why a copy of the etheric body of Jesus of Nazareth was woven into a specially imminent herald to the Christian message beginning with the sixth and seventh centuries. One such herald was Augustine, who in his youth had to go through tremendous struggles. However, 
Only when the impulse to the etheric body of Jesus of Nazareth came to work in him in a significant way did he begin to become engaged in Christian mysticism of his own initiative. His writings can be understood only in this light. Many other personalities in the world, such as uh, Columban or Gallus or St. Patrick, carried within themselves such a copy of Jesus' etheric body and were therefore in a position to spread Christianity and build a bridge from the Christ event to the succeeding times. And so there you have it, that, that there's this developmental uh, process, this gradalis, this, this gradual unfoldment. And, and to bring it within the story of the grail itself, Rita Steiner talks about how when Joseph of Ar Arimathea captured the blood at the crucifixion in the grail, that he, that was the beginning of the grail stream in, in its manifested form. And that he, when he carried the grail off, it was said that later on, it was carried up into the spiritual world and held there by the angels until a man could be worthy of receiving the grail. And that what that refers to is that the, the capturing of the blood and the grail is the capturing of the christened uh, ego uh, of Christ, that that's what that is. And he talks about how in, in the uh, baptism that, that, that the great initiate Jesus vacated and left the vehicles, but he had he had left also an imprint on the vehicles from his ego. And that's important to include in the equation because as Christ enters as the central ego being of this, he was able to take up the attainments that had been made through the incarnation of Jesus of Nazareth. And so this receiving of the blood and the crucifixion into the grail cup has to do with that preserving the the essential nature of that and that the the grail maidens and that whole tradition that's so pictographically represented is a referral to this great event that doesn't take in doesn't take place in a, in a earthly realm exclusively that there's something that's happening on the cosmic level and that's that it's referring to that spiritual economy. That's what's going on there with the understanding of that grail event of the, the cup of Joseph of Arimathea, the tin trader, who brought it eventually to Glastonbury, it is said in the legends. And so you have these legendary accounts and then you have uh, different beings coming into relationship with these vehicles, such as described in the preceding quote. And there's great many other people over the many, many lectures of Rudolf Steiner that Rudolf Steiner gives indications of, of other individuals that have received that type of thing. And you can, you can sense it in, in uh, individuals in more recent times. For example, Father Solanus. He wasn't an intellectual student that you go study theology with. In fact, that he was a... a uh, uh, a member of the uh, Franciscan order, but yet he had possessed great capacity for healing, which is unusual in this age, was much more common in the Middle Ages where they had that aspect of the intellectual soul that would unfold into the higher feeling soul. Because as, as the, the quote before I, I read that, that love is related to the realm of feeling. And that's something that functions within the realm of the archangels. And in pre-Christian times, what you see is this is something that is a familial, is a tribal uh, impulse, that, that whole idea of love for your people. Even when you go to ancient Greece, a Greek would, would take pride and, and identify with his, his city-state, you know, whether he was an Athenian or a Spartan. They, uh, they considered themselves a part of that body politic. And it was on a very dynamic level. But yet, with the turning point of time at the mystery of Golgotha, that 
was shifted. But of course, that's going to unfold gradually throughout the stages of history. And so you have the image in the grail of uh, the titteral uh, keeping the grail in custody during uh, the transition to the grail king Parsifal. I liked what you said about St. Augustine. Augustine was so huge that they had to cut out the table so that he could even get his belly up to the table or else he couldn't reach the table. That's how big he was. So imagine, he may have had a, a Christ in the etheric body, or at least at moments had a Christ in the etheric body, but his astral body was obviously a bit out of control and his ego just didn't know when to stop. And he studied, of course, uh, uh, monarchism, the duality between good and evil, and basically came out of that concept into what he called the city of God. Well, the city of God is basically somewhat of uh, an equivalent to his version of the descent of New Jerusalem. And what is the descent of New Jerusalem? And what is this marriage that we're supposed to have that we, as the pure soul, Sophia, rise up to marry the Lamb of God in New Jerusalem? Well, this is the same tradition that you just mentioned, the, the Merkaba or Merkaba, the, the vessel, I mean the vehicle, or the chariot of Ezekiel, the fiery wheels, the, these images of Enoch being uh, raised into heaven. How is that uh, uh, going to happen? That is an initiate. How is that going to happen for us? It's going to happen slowly, but the same thing is going to happen. And Christ's ascension into heaven is the perfect example of what will happen. But he did it very quickly. We're going to do it rather slowly. So St. Augustine, I'm sure, even though he may have had one, uh, one of the uh, perfected vehicles of Christ from the realm of spiritual economy, it doesn't mean that he didn't reincarnate again and um, not have those gifts. It's something that you must do each time. So Steiner mentions that Towler and Meister Eckhart had a copy of the astral body of Christ. Well, Towler was visited by um, a great initiate. I believe you could expand upon that if you wanted to. But essentially, the um, friend of God from the Highlands, I think that's who it was, that came to Towler and said something to him about the fact that he was a great speaker, a great orator, uh, but that he needed to understand the power of the word and that he needed to go off and be alone and not speak for a very long time. And that's what Tower did. And when he came back, it said, legend or otherwise, that when he gave his first speech, many people swooned because the power of the word, the power of Christ, the power of God was in his astral body. And so when he delivered these sermons, they were transformative to everyone's life who heard them. So that doesn't mean that every single sermon he ever gave was that. And he also created, uh, what's it called? The alphabet of something or another. It's, it takes the letters of the alphabet and goes through and talks about the virtues that you need to develop. That is one of the very best things you can possibly do to tame your astral body. If at one point, myself and others, memorized that and said it every single day, and every time we came up with a challenge in life, we're, we were ready to scream at somebody, we'd say, oh, yeah, let's remember letter D. <laughs> let's remember letter F. And as you do that, you can literally take what Tower got as a very advanced version of the perfection of the human astral body and turn it into something that could be then a tool for others to follow. But don't expect that just because you went off and did what Tower did, not speak for long periods of time. I used to spend every three months out of every year in the summer in silence in the sequoia forest or up in the mountains. And when I would come back as a teacher, it seemed to really not only make me completely aware of the power of the word, but it made me much more careful about how I used my words because they can astral, uh, they could be an astral dart, an astral spear, an astral sword, or they can be the word that heals, the concept that leads you into spiritual evolution. So all of us at different moments may have a characteristic of our future self come to us for a moment. That happens every time you have an intuition. Every intuition is really a truth that exists also 
in some form in the spiritual world that you are imbibing into yourself. And as I said, intuition always alights as love. So these gifts of love that come to us that may only be there for a fraction of a second are the steps that lead us on this path to the vehicle, the chariot that takes you directly into heaven, or as Augustine called it, the city of God. Now, Steiner called it Shambhala, but Shambhala is in the etheric realm, and it's also the realm of New Jerusalem. So it is a realm, one might say, just a little bit above the physical, uh, but still penetrating it. Uh, but you must rise up to it. It is incumbent upon you to make the steps to climb the seven-story mountain, the spiritual mountain, to climb Mount Meru. To, to, they always use the analogy of climbing up the ladder of Jacob or climbing up the hierarchy, the ladder of the hierarchy. But the point is, this is the etheric body. But at the same time, this etheric body as called Shambhala in Eastern traditions, especially Tibetan traditions, which I'm quite familiar with, it was called Agartha. It was called the realm underground. The, the Lord of Agartha was the Lord of the underworld, what I call subnature, what Steiner refers to as subnature. And this is the battle. Are you, where are you headed? Where are your, what are you aiming for? And how fast do you intend to get there? You, we have in this age, because we're on the ascent, we've dipped down as far as we can go. Now we're rising up. You can rise up as fast as you want. There's no limit. When you're in the spiritual world, there's no time or space. Angels, archangels, archai are not limited by time and space. And neither are you when you have moral imagination, moral inspiration, or moral intuition. You are actually embodying higher aspects of yourself. And you are rising up into an etheric realm where New Jerusalem has already created. The victory is already done. We just have to accept the grace and mercy of God, the divine of Christ, and then we start to basically inhabit what they would call in spiritual development, the hut in the spiritual world, the house in the spiritual world. Uh, Steiner called it, uh, Christ called it, uh, in my father's house, there are many mansions. I go there before to prepare them for you. That's the same thing. When you are building through your ego, your astral body, and the gifts of the etheric, which I'm going to talk about next, when you are building that, you are building yourself into the future. And when you reincarnate, if you have built a beautiful dwelling for yourself, it may be a palace, but for somebody else, it may be a hut. Those are all analogies. In other words, it doesn't really um, matter um, how big your house is. It matters how much you've tamed yourself. The more you tame yourself, the more the bigger you're going to be and the bigger the mansion needs to be for you after death. In other words, you need to claim New Jerusalem as your mansion, as your house, as your hut, as that dwelling that you are building on every single day. And that was one of the things that we had uh, chatted about um, before this talk is that we need to keep people focused on the future. If you're focused on the present, and you don't have a vision of the future that we're talking about here, or you don't have the vehicle, the chariot to ride into that etheric realm, then unfortunately, you are building a realm in the opposite direction. You are building a house in the realm of subnature. Rudolf Steiner calls this sometimes aspects of it the eighth sphere. And as I mentioned, it's called Agartha and uh, by the Tibetans. And basically, it's a realm underground. It's a realm that really isn't part of this world. So if you're standing still and you don't have your eye on the goal of embodying these future aspects of yourself, which are, which are higher divine qualities, specifically for us at this point, we would call them the gifts of um, the realm of spiritual economy or else the perfected vehicles of Christ, then where are you going? What are you doing? This is the great gift of the grail. If we ourselves become the grail, it's not ourself that fills the grail. It's the spiritual world. Oftentimes it's seen as the Holy Spirit descending 
into the grail, into this vessel, and then it starts to flow until it flows out over the vessel. Well, that is the etheric realm. Now, the etheric realm is inexplicable. Uh, it's, it's actually incomprehensible. But Steiner gives us many ideas on how to do that, how to contact uh, our ability to perceive the etheric world. He says one realm that you can do that in is in gardening. When you're looking at the plant's etheric body as they grow and the insects as an astral body and the other animals around your garden all interacting, you're beginning to see a part of the etheric. You can also do that through the process of initiation, as I've mentioned, and you can also do it by being a teacher who teaches a child from first through eighth grade because that's when the etheric body is developing between age seven to 14. And if you teach that child and you watch that child over a period of time, as Steiner has Waldorf teachers stay with the same children for all the elementary school years and junior high years from first through eighth grade. And you will see that etheric body in the child. You'll see the astral body as it's descending through the head, down to the throat, into the heart in the young child. And you will then, if you're lucky, and if you spend pretty much the rest of your life focusing on this, you'll be able to begin to witness the etheric body. Now, the strange thing about the etheric body that Steiner tells us is that when you're born, your etheric body, your life body that gives your physical body its life is ancient. It has all wisdom in it. It even has all of the past and it even has the inklings of all of the future. What you will become is inscribed into your etheric body. So the etheric body, for some, could be called the, the grail. For others, they would say, yes, but that without Christ in the ego, the astral body, the etheric, and the physical, then the etheric body would not really be able to provide you with what you need for your true ascension to become a Christ and being. But these are ways that you can begin to witness it and to understand it. But the etheric body is a body that is being, has been already perfected before it's given to you at birth. And it grows younger as you grow older. Now that seems to be inexplicable. But as a child, remember, standing upright, speaking and thinking are the gifts of Christ to the human being. So the etheric body has all of that in it. And it even has your future in it. And you are inscribing into your etheric body everything that you do in your astral body. And if your astral body is dark and connected to materialism and subnature, you can actually begin to darken your etheric body and not have access to what is, in a way, a direct connection to the heavenly world. Now, in Tibetan Buddhism, there is a tradition that literally thousands of great teachers in the Tibetan tradition at the moment of their death have what we call in the West spontaneous combustion. All that's left is either nothing or a pile of ashes where they're, and, and their robes. And what, what happens if you were clairvoyant, you'd see them ascend into heaven like Enoch or uh, Elijah or uh, Ezekiel or others who have translated into heaven. It's the same thing. So Rudolf Steiner said, if you could hear what is happening in your own body, truly hear it with the ears of the spirit, you would burn up right there on the spot. It would, it would extinguish your physical body. It would burn it up and extinguish it. And you can take a stethoscope, listen to your muscles, and you will be shocked at the astounding amount of sound coming out of your body. As a matter of fact, Every muscle you put it on has a different tone, a different quality, and they all work together. You are a sounding symphony of inspiration. And so if you can tap into that and not in darken it through materialism, through gray shadow thinking, but if you can get living thinking, moral imagination, higher thinking, then you can build this chariot and you can not have to have spontaneous combustion, you can slowly burn because that's what we are. We're slowly burning. We are light that has fallen into darkness and we are burning as we are getting out of darkness and radiating out love to our entire environment. And as we do, 
None of that is ever lost. It goes into the future. So when you have a moral imagination, it goes into the future incarnation of the earth called Jupiter. When you have moral inspiration, it goes into the future incarnation of the earth called Venus, Jupiter, Venus, and Vulcan. When you have intuition, it goes into the realm of Vulcan. So you are actually building in those realms who you are going to be in future incarnations, even incarnations beyond the human that has a, a specific physical body bound by physical rules. But as we look into the traditions, this is not uncommon that as you ascend, you literally leave your physical body behind and the pile of ashes is nothing more than the mineral content that was in your body that has been left behind. And as I say, there are many, many documented cases of this. When the tradition of Tibetan Buddhism called Vajrayogini, Vajrayogini is everywhere. Just like in spiritual economy, the perfected vehicles of Christ have infinite capacity to multiply. As Rudolf Steiner said, out of the etheric realm, when you are depressed and sad and at your wit's end and you're ready to give it all up, that now, since 1933 or so, into our age, into our time, Christ will come to those in the greatest of need and actually literally appear to them, gather together the substance just like he did with the apostles, and literally make a manifestation out of this realm of spiritual economy to appear to a person to help save them and to help move them forward. So there's infinite, infinite, multiple uh, copies of these perfected vehicles. And we see with this being Vajrayogini, same thing for her in Tibetan Buddhism. There's infinite copies of her. As a matter of fact, she's the Dakini of all 10,000 Buddhas. She's the Dakini. She's a spiritual uh, initiator of all spiritual beings on the earth who are ascending. And so she's everywhere. And so the Tibetan Buddhists, even before Christ's time, knew that this capacity was there because Christ had already given his three pre-earthly deeds. And in many ca cases, the Tibetan Buddha's teachings come long after Christ's incarnation. So at least three, four, five gifts of, of Christ had already happened at the time that they were saying that this is a tradition that, that the Tibetan Buddhists recognize. Same thing in uh, the Indian tradition, same thing in shamanic traditions, that oftentimes these are called... Um, uh, walkers, uh, what are they called? They, they're called skywalkers. Um, and they can walk in between realms. And that's what we're talking about. If you can tap into the realm of spiritual economy, you reach the realm of what we would call heaven, the realm of Shambhala, the realm of eternal life, the realm of eternal wisdom, the realm where love can then fill you and raise you up through that ascension process. And when we're talking about these gifts that are coming to us right now, it's because humanity has, has crossed the threshold. They've been pulled across the threshold of, of death. So we're living in a time of death. As you pointed out to me the other day, and I had forgotten this, science is nothing more than fear. Fear of what? Fear of death. <laughs> what scientist can describe death to you? What scientist is going to uh, figure out a scientific way to skirt around death? That's what they all will tell you will come by the incarnation of Araman, by the incarnation of materialism on all levels. It's to give you eternal life in a physical body. That's not the goal of spiritual development. Our physical bodies are transforming in every single incarnation. And if you are on the path of ascension, then your body, according to Rudolf Steiner, is beginning to take on the characteristics of the beauty of the astral and the etheric realms, which then on your face in today's age, when you look at somebody, you can begin to see that their morality is written on their face. And who doesn't turn on the TV and watch people who you say before they open their mouth, just looking at them, they are truly evil. They are truly possessed. And I can name a whole bunch of people that I think you'd agree with, but you can begin to see this in our age. So these are not speculative theological or spiritual theories. This is the practice that has been going on for thousands of years that has been refined over time and is basically evolving as we go on into the future. So these are the great mysteries of the quest for the grail. And when you attain the grail, remember, you could also lose it again. 
So you must continue on the quest if you wish to gain what would be called the, the goal of the quest, the, the Holy Grail, which, as we've pointed out in our previous talks, many, many different things are can be described as the Grail. And today, I would say uh, a tamed astral body is a part of the Grail. The etheric body itself is part of the Grail. And the ego that can become christened is also the goal of the Grail. That is when you become the Grail Queen or the Grail King, and you begin to take upon yourself this ascension body, which has been offered to you by the perfected vehicles of Christ. Yes, and uh, to give you another uh, piece of the puzzle in the lecture nine of Spiritual Economy, Rudolf Steiner says, and I quote, the anthroposophist makes himself or herself a living recipient of what was given to Moses and Paul and the Yahweh Christ revelation. It is written in the fifth letter of the apocalypse that the people in the fifth cultural epoch are those who can really absorb the things that will be quite obvious for the cultural period of the Philadelphia community. That's in reference to the, the sixth period. The wisdom of the fifth cultural period will open as a flower of love in the sixth period. Today, mankind is called upon to accept into itself something new, something divine, and thereby to undertake again the ascent into the spiritual world. The spiritual scientific teaching of evolution is being imparted, not because people are supposed to put their blind faith into it, but because mankind is supposed to reach an understanding of it through its own powers of judgment. This teaching is being directed to those who bear the core of the Parsifal nature within themselves. And it is not being proclaimed just in special places or to a special group of people, but human beings from all of humanity will come together to listen to the call of spiritual wisdom. And so you have it that that's, it's a mission, it's a quest, it's, it's something that, that is, is at hand, as they say. And, uh, but I wanted to lead into just one other detail before we run away. And I have to find a, uh, and here he says, although the ego of Jesus of Nazareth left its three sheaths at the baptism of John, a copy of this ego remained in each of them, similar to the imprint a seal leaves behind. The Christ being took possession of these three bodies and of all that which remained as the imprint of the Jesus ego. Beginning with the 12th, 13th, and 14th centuries, something like an ego copy of Jesus was woven into human beings who began to speak of an inner Christ. Meister Eckhart and Towler, who was referenced earlier, were individuals who spoke from their own experience like an ego copy of Jesus of Nazareth. There are still many people present who carry within themselves something like the various bodies of Jesus of Nazareth, but these are now no longer the leading personalities. Increasingly, we see how there are human beings in the fifth epoch who must rely on themselves and on their own ego and how such inspired people have become a rarity. It was therefore necessary that a spiritual tendency develop in our fifth epoch to ensure that humanity would continue to be imbued with spiritual knowledge. Those individuals who are capable of looking into the future had to take care that human beings in the times to come would not be left simply to rely on their human ego only. The legend of the Holy Grail relates that the chalice from which Christ Jesus took the Last Supper with his disciples was kept in a certain place. We see in the story of Parsifal, the course of a young person's education typical of our fifth post-Atlantean epoch. Parsifal had been instructed not to ask too many questions and his dilemma arose 
from following these instructions. And so it goes on from there, the whole idea of the questioning ego. But now things changed in that the ego had become a questioning ego. Today, any soul that acts, accepts passively what is given to it, cannot transcend itself because it merely observes happenings in the physical world around it. In our times, the soul has to ask questions. It has to rise above itself. It has to grow beyond its given form. It must raise questions, just as Parsifal ultimately learned to inquire after the mysteries of the Holy Grail. And so there you have it in a nutshell, that this, this is a striving to which one has to embrace and take up act actively, that it's not a passive, uh, hazy mysticism, but it's a very finely tuned and highly developed way of working with one's personal destiny and thereby working with the destiny of all mankind and what one's particular contribution will be to that endeavor. <clears throat> so I, we've run out of time and I know Douglas has to go eat. This is his, his meal time. And so he can go consecrate his meal and then have something in memory of our Lord. But uh, I, first of all, want to remember, uh, where am I here? I, I always have so many people open that I don't know where they are. And I have to dig this up here. Oh, here it is. I'm lucky. It was right in front of me. But uh, in keeping with, with uh, what I like to do, this podcast has been made possible by the generous support of Tyla and Douglas and Vadim and Vivian and Tim and Jenna and Neil and Christian and Paula and Rick and, and Mary and Ray and Whitney and James and Marilyn and, and so many other people. I love you all for what you've been able to contribute. And uh, if you're interested uh, in serving this endeavor, you can, uh, contribute towards me buying a cup of coffee or something. No amounts too small at paypal.me forward slash John Barnwell 888. And uh, for Douglas here, uh, down below, we have links uh, that can provide you with access to a Tyler and Douglas Gabriel's bookshelf. And you can download copies of their uh, books for free uh, on the link below, or you can order paper copies of, of many of them over on Amazon, but uh, avail yourself of that in their websites, Neoanthroposophy and the Gospel of Sophia and, and all these wonderful uh, things that, that they've been able to contribute to the world, gift to the world, and also through American intelligence media and Americans for Innovation. But that's, there's so much there on the table. Uh, as for myself, I've written two books. My first book is currently uh, reprinting uh, slowly, but uh, The Spiritual Science of the Holy Blood and of the Holy Grail, a study developed out of the work of Rudolf Steiner of the underground streams of esoteric Christianity, which flowed from the Brotherhood of the Holy Grail to the Order of the Knights Templar and the True Rosicrucian Order, and it has a forward by my buddy here, Douglas, 640 pages uh, with a great many diagrams, all of which are also included in my second book, plus a great many more, The Arcana of Light on the Path with the foreword by the note of astrosopher and psychologist William Bento, who passed on not too many years ago. But that's the series of grail cosmological diagrams that can help you sort through a lot of the... Uh, content that we share on these conversations. and But this is available on eBay directly from me, or you can contact me by private message on Facebook, or there's an academia link below. You can download the foreword by William Bento for free. And you can also contact me, like say, if you're outside the country or you just prefer to do it that way. And so that's a great many things that I have to remember to do here. And click like and subscribe to my channel. And uh, 
in parting, I just want to share with you, uh, where is it here? I think it's right here, isn't it? Yes. Uh, for week 48 of the calendar of the soul by Rudolf Steiner. Within the light that out of worldwide heights would stream with power toward the soul, may certainty of cosmic thinking arise to solve the soul's enigmas and focusing its mighty rays, awaken love in human hearts. And that's a translation by Ruth and Hans Busch. So I want to thank you so much. And, and Douglas, I want to thank you for your brilliance and your patience. <laughs> well, there's not much brilliance to thank me for, but yeah, I have infinite patience because I have seven children. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks to everybody for showing up. And so we'll see you in the next exercise of, of our quest for truth. <laughs>